Thank you all for joining us. Um, and just as a reminder, each presenter has 15 minutes to speak and then five minutes um, for discussion. Um, you're very welcome to use chat um, to ask questions um, and to private chat with each other about things as we go through, but do recall the um, code of conduct and act um, inclusively and politely at all times. Um, and of course, since we are working across a multi-continental um, platform, um, if there are technical difficulties, please just bear with us and um, enjoy the conference. And so with that, um, I look forward to introducing our first speaker, who is Arnaud Bignon and his co-authors, um, Emilio Vacari, Beatrice Weisfield, and Brian Chatterton. And are you here, Arno? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and so he'll be sharing with us about um, reassessment of the order of trinuclida and phylogeny and systematics at the familial level. So go ahead, Arno. Hello, everyone. During this presentation, I will talk about two phylogenetic uh, analyses that I perform with my colleagues on the trinucleates. The, the aim of the first analysis was to clarify the position of this group at uh, the uh, rank of the order and to propose a preliminary uh, overview of their evolution. The second analysis is mostly based on the basal trinucleate in order to understand the relationship between the distinct family. Up to now, this group is uh, considered as a superfamily uh, of the order Azafida, and in turn, this group is considered as rising from the paraphyletic order Tychoparida. Presently, this family is this superfamily is composed of five uh, distinct families: the very successful Trinucleidae, which is characterized by a marginal facial structure and the perforated fringe, the bilaminar perforated fringe. Uh, the Dionididae pre present a similar character, uh, cephalic characteristic, um, but with a posterior body much more robust. Another successful group, the Raphiophoridae, uh, share only with the two previous one uh, families, the marginal facial structure. In terms, the Azataspididae is more corresponding to the Azafid and Ticoparoid by having a dorsal and a complex uh, facial structure. And finally, we have the Cambrian Yostracinidae characterized by a ventral median structure between uh, the two divisions. In order to uh, sum up uh, the current interpretation of the relationship, since the 50s, the Raphiophoridae, Trinucleidae, and Dionididae are interpreted as forming a monophyletic clad, but their relationship are still not well understood. <coughs> In contrast, uh, the Alzata Spididae, since the two, three last decades, uh, correspond to a progressive aggreg aggregation of other families. And the Iostracinidae are interpreted as a transition between uh, the other Azafid and the most derived trinucleid. This group is very important uh, in the context of the great Ordovician biodiversification because the Azata Spidae uh, correspond to the first Agbex fauna and the Dionididae to the second one. Uh, in contrast, the Trinoclidae and Raphiophoridae are fundamental elements of the white rock fauna. So if we compare basal uh, trinucleates with other members of the order Azafida, in the first sight, it's rather difficult to, define, to identify similarities. These groups are real, related um, on three um, key characters. Firstly, they share um, a median zone on the glabella, whereas in the ticoparid, it's more situated on the, um, on the occipital ring. 
They have also uh, globular uh, protaspis or larva, which is interpreted as a um, uh, planktonic mode of, mode of life. In comparison, uh, the ptychopalids have uh, flat larva and more similar to the adult um, morphology. And finally, this interpretation allows a progressive reduction of the rostral plate situated between the two Librigenae, leading to the median suture uh, of the majority of Asafida and to the complete fusion uh, of the Librigenae, uh, characteristic of the trinucleoid. However, uh, several recent works uh, put in doubt uh, some of these characters. As uh, we have the description of flat protaspis in other azaphids, and also within the Leostracinidae. Moreover, in this group, we have the evidence of the presence of a rostral place. So, this um, uh, result leads us to check if the trinucleids are closer to the azaphid or to the Ptychopalida. And our analysis sustains that the uh, trinucleids are closer to the Ptychopalida than any other member of the other Azafida. However, including uh, this group within uh, the other Ptychopalida will only sustain uh, a parameter. That is why we decided to raise uh, this group as a monophyletic and independent uh, new order. So the previous uh, character used to link uh, Azafida with Trinucleida appear uh, morphological convergences, which lead us to define uh, various morphotype of globular protaspis, which will be uh, most probably useful in uh, future uh, study on the trilobites. Now, if we take a deeper look on the evolution of the Trinucleida, it appears that the uh, Leostracinidae are a sister group of all the other uh, members of this group. The Azataspidae are strongly uh, paraphyletic. Uh, Trinucleid and Raphiophorid appear sister group. And surprisingly, the Dionididae uh, are considered as a subclade of the family Raphiophorida. So these results lead us to perform uh, another phylogenetic analysis, but this time more focused on the Azataspididae in order to better understand uh, the relationship between these distinct families. We enjoy this analysis to test also uh, the relationship of Trinucleida with uh, the order Arpetida. This order is also interpreted as rising from the Ptychoparida. Uh, and this group presents the interest that he have also um, a perforated fringe. And our results are, are rather surprising because uh, the outgroup is um, a little bit dispersed along the trees. The Leostracinidae appear closer to the outgroup than the other member of uh, the order Azafida. That is why we remove uh, completely this family from the order. The Azataspidae also appear very uh, dispersed along the tree. For luck, uh, Raphiophorid and Trinucleid are still a uh, sister group. But another surprise, the Dionididae are completely uh, distinguished from them. So this result leads us to define two uh, new solid groups, a uh, suborder, uh, the suborder Trinucleina, composed by Orometopidae, Raphiophoridae, and Trinucleidae. Between many other uh, synapomorphies, uh, we identify uh, the alae, the little wing on both sides of the glabella, as rising from the second glabellar lobe. This character is visible on the adults of the oromethodoids, but only on the juveniles of 
uh, hydrophoric and three nucleates. The other uh, suborder, Dionidina, corresponds to Dionididae, Azataspididae, Nindididae, and Heterocaryonidae. Um, within uh, Dionididae, we were able to identify that this time the allae rise from the second and the third glabellar lobe. And surprisingly, we find this uh, structure in uh, several raphiophorids. And this result explains why in the first time we obtained the Dionididae uh, as a subclade of the family Raphiophorida is because several um, Dionidae were misplaced, misplaced uh, within the Raphiophorida because they don't have um, a perforated fringe. Uh, linked the Dionididae with uh, the other family of this new suborder is a little bit uh, complicated because this group presents a very strong uh, pygidium with many segments. In contrast, in the other uh, group, the pygidium is interpreted, interpreted as very small and very few segments. The issue with this group is the difficulty to uh, identify the limit between the pygidium and the thorax. Within the Dionididae, uh, there is um, a distal, uh, a lateral uh, border that we interpret uh, from a distal slope of the pleura, pleurae of the, of the member of this, of this group. The, uh, beginning of the of this slope, we, inter we interpret the beginning of this slope as marking the limit between the thorax and the pygidium. This interpretation leads to having, uh, leads having a pygidium much more similar in shape and, uh, in, uh, and segmental number as the, the Dionidid. Uh, the heterocaryonids correspond to a mix between uh, former azataspid and uh, basal uh, arpeggid. The morphology of the glabellar, uh, the glabellar lobe, the position of the, of the eyes sustain uh, this relationship in comparison with uh, the other arpeggids. This uh, group were linked because um, uh, basal arpeggite bear uh, also distal and vertical spine on the pygidium. However, if we look more deeply, the, we think the heterocaryonids, the spine rise from the anterior and posterior pleural bands, whereas in the basal uh, arpeggite, the spine rise only from the posterior band. And so our results on the taxonomy of the uh, Trinocleida imply several changes in the biodiversity uh, data set uh, of this group. The most drastic change corresponds to the number of uh, the reduction of, uh, of the number of genera of Alberta Spidae and by the rising of um, several families. If we look at this uh, data set uh, with, during the time, the change is more important because uh, Fauna of the uh, IBEX-1 appear closely, nearly restricted to the Tremadocian, whereas the White Rockian Fauna uh, initiate only during the Florian. For the place the Dionididae uh, for the moment is a little bit complicated because over the 45 species included in this family, more than the half, uh, associated to one genus, Dionidae. So first, more studies are necess uh, necessary to, to better understand them, and most probably uh, the number of genera will increase within this group. And to conclude, uh, this presentation with another colleague, Diego Balseiro, 
we are uh, preparing uh, another study uh, where we reconsider re the uh, morphological data set of food, but a much more finite uh, temporal scale. And this result uh, highlight that uh, during the upper Cambrian and lower ordovician, the extension within the trilobite is more concentrated in the center of the morphological space, which corresponds basically to the um, uh, ticoparaid uh, morphotype. In contrast, during the Florian, we can see an important increase of the disparity variance um, of the disparity variance of the trilobite. So these results are uh, coherent with uh, the previous one while showing a stronger uh, distinction between the first Abexian fauna and the uh, Watrokian fauna. Many thanks for your attention. Fantastic. That was really interesting um, breakdown of just so much diversity within this clade. Does mm -hmm. anyone have um, a question they'd like to ask of Arno? Mm -hmm. I don't see any hands right now. So um, let me ask a question then. So with yeah. the with the diversity that we see, you, that you see across these different morphologies, is there also a diversity of, of ecological habitat? I know the cryptolithus in, in the Cadian of North America is, you know, kind of blind in a deep water trinucleid. Are, there, are all the trinucleids a deeper water clade or is it more diverse as far as their ecology? I think, I am thinking that it's more diverse. And um, I have to, to, to work more on this, uh, on this subject, but uh, I don't believe that uh, they are strongly associated to deep environment. Okay. For me, yeah. they not necessarily lost uh, the eyes from living in deep habitat. But more investigation has to be done on this uh, subject also. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I think Sophia also has a question. Sophia, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Arno. Thank you for the presentation. And I would like to know you, to know um, one, once Psychopyra is a waste bin taxon with a little bit of everything, uh, there is any reason for you to select these or that uh, taxa to, to call Ptychoparida uh, for, for, or you just select uh, those uh, species from Ptychoparida that were um, better known? Yes, I use the Ptychoparida, it's another word, so I don't, I can't uh, know uh, all the biodiversity of this group. And I took the most, uh, the most famous one to, to test it. Um, the, I think the morphological changes are not so important to orient it, orientate it, the, the analysis. It's just because there are so uh, variability in cyclic yeah. corridor yeah. that some halters didn't uh, accept this yeah. order anymore. And I was wondering if you select other taxa to code from Pticopardi, if the results will be the same. And I also have another question, if I have time. Um, you show in the last um, uh, slides the distribution of some of the, the taxa, but did you use or check the stethographic evidence to see if it is in agreement with the phylogenetic data that you um, get? For example, there are some people saying that we don't, we shouldn't use stratigraphy uh, to do phylogenetic analysis. But if you have those that data, this is you have an ancestral, uh, and did you check in the stratigraphic data if it fits? Now, for the moment, uh, I don't have the time to to do it. 
to complete your, your previous question, maybe that uh, if we look more deeper in the Tycho-Paleoid, we can meet uh, more uh, ancestral of, of the tunnel plate within this group. But uh, it's so huge to, to investigate for the moment that little by little I try to aggregate uh, all, the, all the group. Um, uh, so, see, yes, um, we have some like, uh, some within the um, cartography, and maybe if we, we will be able in the future to identify more ancestors to, to, to link the group uh, between them. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Arno. Very interesting talk. Um, so let's okay. go to our next speaker. So um, you can stop your screen share and we can shift. Perfect. Okay. Um, our next speaker um, is Aska Sorensen, who has co authors of Arna Nielsen, Nicholas Teibold. Zheng Fu Xiao, Niels Shospo, and Tay Stahl. And he will be speaking about a cyclostratigraphic analysis of the late Cambrian alum shale. So shifting topics a little bit. Are you here, Asuka? OK. OK. Great. So can you see? It's perfect. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so um, I want to present a cyclostratigraphic analysis of the late Cambrium uh, alum shale. Uh, and it has implications for the geological time scale, sea level change, and evolution of the Earth Moon system. So it's uh, basically a summary of the article uh, Astronomically Forced Climate Change in the Late Cambrium uh, that was um, published earlier this year. Um, and it was a part of my master thesis and I'm working here as a scientific assistant for Thijs Dahl at the, the Globe Institute at University of Copenhagen. So, First of all, the purpose of this study was to try if we could identify Melanchthon cycles in the Lake Cambrium using XF data from two drill cores from the alum shale formation. And if this was possible, then we will uh, establish a time frame, use the result to establish a time frame for the Lake Cambrium and for the SPICE event, which is a positive carbon excursion event. Uh, occurred in the late Cambrium. And then we wanted to reconstruct the alum shale sedimentation rate and compare these rates to the sea level. And lastly, we want to determine the late Cambrium earth moon distance and day length. So the alum shale formation was formed here at the Baltica continent at the southern hemisphere and now been, that has drifted up to the northern hemisphere and can be found today in the uh, most part of uh, Scandinavia. Uh, and the uh, shale was deposited from uh, 505 to 480 billion years ago from the mid Cambrian to the early Portuguesian. And um, this study focused on two drill cores from the alum shale formation, one from the southern Sweden uh, called uh, Vogeltofte and one from uh, the Danish island called Bonhoeng, uh, called Billigrau 2 core. And here's a picture of the drill core. And as you can see, it's a black shield and it has no visually signs of any cycles. But um, we analyzed uh, approximately 30 elements uh, from obtained from the XRF at a very high resolution, 0.2 millimeters. And then we see how the elements relate to each other, how they vary it. So this is a correlation analysis where we can see uh, the different elements group, group each other. For example, we see 
pyrite and uh, the redox sensitive elements. And over here we have the clay elements. So we look for size in each of these groups of elements, which on all the elements expressed cycles, but especially the sulfur content had really significant cycles. So therefore, uh, our fo we focus on the sulfur content in, in the course. So the first step was to identify the cycles and we used the spectrum analysis, uh, the Thomson multiple taper uh, spectrum. And um, we find one cycle in the focal chapter two core from Sweden, uh, a really significant cycle with a period of 1.6 meters. And also a, a cycle with a period around uh, 44, um, Ella, 0 0.44 meters. But if we look at the wavelet spectrogram of the core, we can see that there's a lot of intervals where we also find higher frequency cycles, for example, here in the Parvulina and also here in the bottom bottle of uh, the Ulina Superzone. And we can see these cycles are moving parallel to each other. And this is due to uh, variable sedimentation rates. And if we take the ratio of these cycles we detect, it matches with the Milankovitch cycles uh, uh, from the Lake Cambrian. If you look at the other core from Bornholm, we find one significant cycle with a period of uh, 70 centimeters. But again, if we look at the spectrogram, we also find intervals with higher frequency cycles that are also significant. And we're going to look at some of these intervals later. So the next step uh, was that we filtered out the long eccentricity cycle, because yeah, this these was the long eccentricity cycles the last uh, four hundred five thousand years. So the next step that was that we filtered them out and see if we could correlate them between the two cores, and uh, this was possible. We find uh, eight, four hundred five thousand year cycles in each core. And this correlation is also consistent with the biostatigraphy, and it's also consistent with the uh, molybdenum curves as we use for stratigraphic correlation in these settings. So then we can cal calibrate uh, our data to this um, time frame we got here and reanalyze the data. When we do this for the for the chapter two core, a really uh, significant peak occurs at 32,000 years. This is the obliquity period we find here. But also, if we zoom in on the lower Ulin superzone, we also find the precision cycle along with the obliquity cycle. So this is basically this these two cycles as we see as we zoom in on this interval. And also for the Bilikar 2 core, uh, we find some peaks around 100,000 years, correspond to the 100,000 years uh, eccentricity cycle. But again, if we zoom in on this specific interval, we find a cycle with a period of 30,000 years, and uh, along with two peaks from the short eccentricity cycle. Yeah. Um, but now let's focus on this interval. Because uh, if we filter out the precision cycle, we, this is the red curve, as you see here. Uh, we see that the amplitude of the precision cycle is modulated. And, and in this uh, interval, we find six modulation. It has an average duration of 106 thousand years, so the precision cycle is modulated by the short eccentricity cycle in this interval. And some other interesting feature of this interval is that in the agnostic specific zone, we don't find any precision cycle at all, but just at the boundary, the precision cycle appears. And opposite, the obliquity cycle has a really high amplitude in the agnostic specific zone, and then lower its amplitude in the Ulina Supersum. 
And this occurs just at the boundary between agnostic spiciformis zone and the Ulema zone. And this boundary is defined by an extension event of trilobites. And it's also the boundary between the mid uh, cambrium and the uh, upper cambrium, late cambrium. So something is going on here. And we have to understand this in the future. Something we want to work on. And then we find out that the Ulean superzone lasted 3.4 billion years. And this is also consistent with the GSA's estimation of by 3 million years. And the Pavulin superzone lasted 1.9 million years. Then we reconstructed the sedimentation rates. And the sedimentation rate for both, both cores has an upgoing trend throughout the Ulean the Ulena superzone. And especially, it has a peak just at the boundary between the Ulean superzone and the Paulina superzone. So this trend, if we compare this trend to the <coughs> sea level curve, and here the sea level curve is constructed by sequence stratigraphy, it also has this trend through the Ulean superzone that the sea level dropped throughout the zone while the sedimentation rate increased here at the uh, throughout the Ulean superzone. So maybe in the future, we could use both cyclic stratigraphy and sequence stratigraphy to reconstruct the past um, sea level. Here you see how this next bar, we see how the phases uh, matches really well between the two cores, 405,000 year cycle. And here we have the uh, isotopes, the carbon isotopes, and we define here as a rel from relatively sta stable values to relatively stable values again lasted about uh, 3 million years. So the SPICE event lasted 3 million years according to our study. Uh, then we want to see how well we could uh, uh, find the obliquity period because both the obliquity period the axial precision, the Cambrian, the daling, and the Earth Moon distance are all coupled. So if you know one of these parameters, you also know the others. And then um, for, for 250 million years and further back, uh, the Earth Moon distance carries a large uncertainty for the theoretical models. So therefore, it's really good to have some um, measurements of the Earth moon distance. So that is what we want to do uh, by determining the obliquity period. So we find this interval where we have a lot of obliquity periods. As you see here from the spectrum of the interval, it has a really significant peak. And um, the obliquity is also really consistent throughout this interval. So therefore, uh, we used this interval. And uh, we basically took the filtered output uh, of the obliquity cycle and then take, find the duration of each cycle and take the mean duration of this. And here we find an obliquity period of 31.4 million years. So uh, using this result, we could calculate the late Cambrian Earth Moon distance to be 368.9 thousand uh, kilometers away from Earth during the late Cambrian. And this results also matches with other observations. It has this trend of the Moon is moving away from the Earth. Um, and this uh, also matches with the ocean model, which is a theoretical prediction of the Moon's evolution. Um, which is nice. And then we calculate the day length to be uh, 21.78 hours per day. And uh, this also matches with the fossil data uh, where you can obtain the day length by, by counting days per year by fossil who has growly date length band that modulate uh, annually each year. So 
to summarize, the, we success successfully uh, identified melancholy cycles in the late Cambrian alum shale. So the ratio between these detected periods are consistent with the expected melancholy cycles for the late Cambrian and the observed 405,000 years extrinsicity cycle can be correlated between the two cores and consistent with the biostratigraphy and the molybdenum curves. We find that the duration of the Uliana superzone, which is equal to the Pipian states, uh, was 3.4 million years, and the Parvulina superzone was uh, 1.9 uh, million years. And the spice event lasted three million years. We reconstructed the alum shell sedimentation rates, which appears to be inversely related to the seal of the curve. And lastly, we find that the late Cambrian Earth Moon distance and day lengths are 368.9 thousand meters and 21.78 hours, respectively. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Pasca. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to pose? Questions? Must be some. Roy Plotnick has a question. Roy, would you like to go ahead? Oh, it's just more of a, a research interest here because we see ship, I notice you, you mentioned there was a shift in the dominance of uh, yeah. Was eccentricity versus uh, obliquity in the climate cycle? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right there. So there's something that's very similar to that that's seen in the Pleistocene. They switch from uh, a uh, obliquity dominated uh, climate cycle to a uh, eccentricity dominated climate cycle. I think the interesting question is going to be uh, what is, I mean, um, all of these together are changing uh, the distribution of solar radiation. Yeah. The question becomes is in the order of, in this period of time, how is that being filtered through the climate system? And yeah. uh, we've done some work where we look at, yeah. And also you mentioned the uh, um, um, sediment yield. Yeah, climate is also going to be sensitive to these and that's going to change sediment yield and therefore deposition rates in the environment too. So it's interesting to see that you've got, got this relationship between the deposition rates and the, uh, the, sea, the sea level sequence. And I yeah. have a number of years ago with Marty Perlmutter, where we, where we modeled that. Okay. So it's in, I think just thing would be interesting to see how exactly what is the, the climate mechanism yeah. for that That's switch, how, that, how this is being processed. Yeah. We, we, know, we don't know that at the moment, but we have speculated because the Milanovi cycles are controlling the, um, the, yeah, the distribution of sunlight throughout the year. So mm -hmm. it goes from a high, um, yeah, from a warm summer to a cold winter and opposite. So we have, we have speculated that this sulfur um, content we are observing maybe reflect the uh, desert formation and, uh, and dust deposit in the alum shale because uh, it's euxenic bottom uh, at the alum shale. So the pyrite formation is uh, controlled by the reactive iron uh, into the sea. So we think that maybe when there's a really cold winter, uh, we find a peak of sulfur because there's more dust uh, in these periods. But this, but this uh, change, we have no idea why we observe this, this uh, switch. But we also observe it in another core where it's even more pronounced. So there's definitely something going on. Yeah, well, it's, it's eccentricity modulates the precession cycle. You have no eccentricity, precession cycle has no effect. So when you have high eccentricity, you're going to have a lot of precession uh, uh, produced effects. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Asuka, there are a couple of comments in the chat, one from Matthias and one from Keith. 
if you want to respond to those. Yeah, if that's time, then. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? It's interesting. We all want to know. Can I get the question or should I read oh, them? Oh, I, I can read them to you. Um, sorry. So Matthias asks, um, he says, exciting work. Did you look in detail at other elements other than sulfur, such as the detritals or aluminum or titanium or redox? Yes. Um, and whether or not there that some of those elements might respond um, the same or differently to paleoclimatological yeah. processes. Yes, we, we also looked at the other elements. So, um, yeah. Here I've analyzed the same interval uh, for aluminum. And I also find the same two peaks. And if, as you can see here, they are inversely correlated. They are negative correlated. So we don't know if which element who lose the other element in this case. But we just uh, choose sulfur because it's more pronounced in the spectrum. So we don't know if it's, for example, a flux in the, in the clay elements who is uh, variating cyclic and then diluting the pyrite content who come from another source or is the opposite around. We cannot know this at the moment. Thanks very much. Um, it sounds like you've got a lot of more interesting work you can do with these cores. So look forward to hearing more about it in the future. All right, with that, let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker. So our next talk um, is by Berger Schmitz. He will be discussing the breakup of the l parent body, its signature in mid-Ordovician sediments in Balto Scandia, and the precise timing relative to the Ordovician biodiversification expansion. OK, hello. Berger. Do you hear me and see me? Yes. or at least in my talk. So I will try to talk about the breakup of the l parent body, body its signature in mid ordovician sediments in Baltoscandia and the precise timing relative to Ordovician biodiversity expansion. Actually, I can already warn you, I don't know anything about the last thing, but we'll get there. So we know uh, something about life in the Ordovician period, but what happened in space at the same time? It's easy to, to reconstruct from sediments and from fossils, life on Earth um, in Ordovician, but it's, uh, there's almost no data, almost no knowledge about what happened in space at the same time. But we think we know something, and uh, this is a discovery based on a, a couple of different um, uh, pieces of evidence. We know that 470 million years ago, an about 150 kilometers large asteroid broke up in the asteroid belt. This is the largest documented asteroid breakup event that we know of with the type of consequences that I will discuss. Uh, one of the main asteroid, in the asteroid families in the asteroid belt form, this is the breakup of the l parent parabody. Uh, I'll give a little oversight of how do we know this? How do we know that this is not just science fiction? The primary evidence was, was found already in the 1960s by people who were studying the meteorites that fall on Earth now. And it's actually about a quarter of all meteorites that fall on Earth today originate from this breakup event. It's the Elkondrites. Elkondrite is a kind of stony meteorite common stony meteorite, ordinary chondrites, and they are of three kinds, H, L, and LL, mainly depending on the iron content. So the L chondrites is the most common type of meteorites that fall today. And what researchers discovered in the 1960s was that the L chondrites, they have a potassium argon isotopic age of about 470 million years, which is different to most other meteorites that have potassium isotope, potassium argon isotopic ages of about 4,000 million years, going back to the origin of the solar system. 
And potassium argon isotopes, they measure when, when if something is, uh, when, when argon, the, the potassium argon system is reset, reset, the potassium argon isotopic clock is reset, and that is when something experiences high pressure or high temperature and the argon is driven out. This uh, man on the photo here, or young guy, he's 13 year old, he's the, the only known person on earth uh, that has been hit by a meteorite in his head and survived. Uh, in 1994, and it was an L chondrite with a potassium argon isotopic age of about 407 million years. And this is logical. If you're going to be hit by a meteorite on your head and survive, it's likely to be the most common type of meteorites that hits you. So here you see a diagram of the L chondrite age distribution, potassium argon ages. Uh, here you have 4,000 million years, and you have this huge peak. Um, at around 500 million years. And this was discovered already in the 1960s. And uh, uh, this, this body, 150 kilometers in di diameter, that's three to 4,000 times bigger than the body that hit Earth uh, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary 66 million years ago. Uh, somehow, this uh, breakup event probably created an asteroid family. And uh, these are the fam asteroid families, the largest asteroid families that we know of. This is the distance in astronomical units from this, the sun. And uh, uh, we don't know which asteroid family that formed in this event. It has been speculated that it was the Flora family, which is one of the largest families. It has been speculated that it's the Gephion, Gephion family, but right now, we don't have the answer to this question. But the second, second strong evidence that this event has taken place is if one looks at the impact structures on Earth. There are about 200 craters known. And uh, if you read the papers by Martin Schmieder et al, um, a couple of papers the last years, he has uh, uh, made these type of diagrams and uh, they all show that there is a peak in, impact, in, in craters. There's an overabundance of craters in the 30 million years after this breakup event. It, it may take up to 30 million years for, for an asteroid that, that was uh, ejected at this event to get to Earth. It's, it's very complicated. I'm not going to talk about it. So, but this is, this is the only asteroid shower, asteroid in the meaning of big objects like uh, bigger than one kilometer or bigger than half a kilometer. This is the only asteroid shower or comet asteroid that, that we have evidence for in the, in the geological record. So this is evidence number two, uh, a large number of craters that formed shortly after this breakup event. And here is a map of, of uh, some of these cr Most craters in Baltuscandia, you have it down here, most uh, impact structures in Baltuscandia, they are from this period, from the order vision. So it's amazing how closely, how close these craters, it's, it's the same scale in the two, the North American and the Scandinavian. Uh, and you see there are there's a many, or, or a majority of the craters that are known from, from this region that is shown here are, are from uh, the 30 million year period after, uh, after the breakup event. However, what is important to, to consider is that these are all relatively small craters. It's nothing like the Schick's Club crater or something like that. Like 10, 20 years ago, we thought that we would find like a, a, a big crater some, somewhere, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shower of relatively small asteroids. And, and this is logical because the upper, limb, upper size of the, the body that was broken up limits the size of the, the, the bodies that can hit Earth. So the third evidence uh, that uh, really um, put, put, um, put this uh, on a much more detailed level, this understanding, it's from a, from a quarry at Kinnikulle in southern Sweden. There are more than 100 fossil meteorites from this event have been found by quarry workers in Ordovician for under 70 million year old limestone in Sweden. You see Mario Tassinari, late Mario Tassinari, and, the, oh, and two of the owners of the quarry holding up a big meteorite. Very low sedimentation rates, four millimeters per thousand years. There are meteorites in, in 
there are, there are meteorites that have come from all different beds. So it's not a question of one, one uh, meteorite shower. These are meteorites that, this is a meteorite rain or a meteorite shower going on for two or three million years. So we have evidence of an asteroid shower from the craters. We have an evidence for a meteorite shower because, uh, let me say fun, some, one thing more. The meteorites are all, except one, they are all of one kind. They are alchondrites. And uh, uh, in the beginning we had hoped, or we thought that we might get evidence of the different types of meteorites that fell on Earth in the Ordovician. But, uh, this, we, we still uh, collect uh, the meteorites, but this is very boring. It has become very boring. It's just four or five new elkondrites every year. Uh, paleontologists, please look on the upper part of the image. Uh, that's the meteorite and don't care about the autoceratite at the base. The meteorites fell over an area of about 40,000 square meters during two million years. This is one of the meteorites. And here, down here, you have another one that is still in, um, in, the, in, the, in the mountain, in the section. And from all this data, we can see that the flux of meteorites was at least two orders of magnitudes higher than today. In perfect agreement with what we saw from the crater, from the higher number of craters. And here is the, the same meteorites that you see at the base, it sits out. So. So, and uh, when, uh, during the last 25 years, I, one of the questions that, that came up early is that, why are all these meteorites found uh, right associated with the Telstein event? The Telstein event is, is uh, generally considered as a major sea level drop. And uh, uh, it's, you can see traces of it along the section here, like a gray band at Chinnacle. And you can see it here, this is uh, the Telstein event on Erland. You have the gray band here as well. And so one of the early questions was, is there a relation? Does, does, does this meteorite flux, this elkondrite pair breakup have, has anything to do with the, with the Telstein? But uh, one, one answer is easy. The, on Chinnacule, the only part of this uh, 50 meter high section, the only part that is being quarried for producing stone plates, stone slabs, is from about one meter below the Telstein to, to uh, one meter above the Telstein. Uh, the, the reason for this is that this is the only section, this, the lithology of this section, it's very clean, it's very clean limestone. There's very little um, dirt, very little clay, very little, uh, except in, in some bands, but the limestone is much cleaner. And this has been over this interval across the tailstone. And this has been known for 450 years or even longer probably. Um, the tailstone bed is really strange. Uh, you have these, um, beds concentrated with uh, large cystoids. Uh, so um, uh, a lot of uh, thoughts have been uh, on this, uh, on the origin of this bed. Uh, we, decided, we found a way to try to solve this question, to try to see, um, try to establish whether there wasn't, uh, whether it was just coincidence that, or whether the fact was that, that the meteorites were recovered in the quarry since they, for that end, uh, would there be meteorites uh, further down in, at the, if, if one quarried at other levels, etc. And we invented this method to search for sediment dispersed chromatic grains from coarse micrometeorites. The flux of micrometeorites must have been higher than the flux of meteorites, and our idea was that there, in, together with these uh, large meteorites, there also came micrometeorites that contained these. Um, these, these um, chromite grains that are very resistant. Relict chromite grains, that's the only common mineral in meteorites that survives weathering on Earth. It makes up about a quarter of a percent of original meteorite. All information about fossil meteorites, like type and group, must be obtained from these grains. You can do all types of analysis on these grains, trace and major elements, oxygen, chromium, and neon isotopes, and you even find inclusions of silica or other minerals in there. So, uh, um, like already like 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we realized we're back now in the helices section and you see this interval here, the white arrow here, that corresponds to the quarried interval at the Torsberg quarry. Here in the helices quarry, 
this, this is abandoned, so, so um, but uh, you have a much larger part of the section exposed here. So we dissolved 791 kilogram of rock from every level below this yellow line. And extraterrestrial chromate grains were extremely rare. These are larger grains, larger than 63 microns. So about two grains per 100 kilogram. But in every sample, above almost every sample above this, this yellow line, we find two to four extraterrestrial grains per kilogram. So it's at two orders of magnitude higher uh, content of extraterrestrial grains there. We wanted to go deeper into this, so we, we made very, very detailed studies and were able to locate the exact level where the chromite grains come in. It's about one meter below, um, about two meters below the, 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 the base of the tailstone. Here you see the interval that is quarried at Shinnikula, where they find the fossil meteorites. And we were able to establish that one would probably not find any fossil meteorites, even if one quarried uh, the interval below one meter. Um, and the strongest evidence comes from this, that the percentage of L grains is, gets close to 100, 100 there. Here's another piece of evidence. Uh, the breakup was somewhere down here. This is the tailstone. This is the hellish quarry. This is another piece of evidence that the breakup was here. In the fossil meteorites that are covered in the Torsberg quarry at the other locality, uh, the Neon 21 that is produced by cosmic rays while the meteorites are, are out in space, it increases gradually up through the section. So these meteorites were out that are from this center, from the upper interval, they were out in space for a much longer time than these that, that are down here. So the breakup event must have been somewhere here. Uh, the, the final nail in the coffin, or what, how to explain the final evidence that uh, where we could, at the, with a very high resolution, locate the level where that corresponds more or less exactly to the breakup event, come from this extraterrestrial helium-3 data. At, minus, at, one, at two meters below the telestain bed or one meter below the base of the archaeologian, helium-3 goes up by three, three to four orders of magnitude. There must have been enormous amount of extraterrestrial dust coming into Earth at that time. Uh, a very, very important contribution to this, to, to I think at least that, uh, to, to uh, how, how I think uh, we have moved forward in this, is a study, was a study that we looked at when we discovered this by Lynn Skog uh, et al, that showed that the Telstein uh, sea level fall actually starts right at this level. Uh, and we confirmed, we, we produced our own data and confirmed that already down here, uh, the alumina, the clay content goes down, and uh, it's more or less uh, already the quarry workers known that knew this because they, they are quarrying this interval. Uh, what type of meteorites fell before, down here, before the breakup? We know that they are very, very strange. They are, you could sell them for a fortune on eBay, uh, the meteorites that fell at that time. Rare meteorites were common in the Ordovician period before the LCPB. I will not get into the details of how, the, how, how we have established this. You can see Heck, Heck et al. in Nature Astronomy 2017. The meteorites below, bef that settled on Earth before the breakup event, uh, they are very, very strange, uh, pr so-called primitive achondrites, but I'm not going into the details. I, I mentioned before that we found one meteorite that is not an achondrite, it's a new type of solar system material river recovered from Ordovician limestone. Down here you have chromium isotopes, here you have oxygen-3. This, this plots all known meteorite types, all, all, all types of meteorites, about 160 types that we have. And this meteorite falls, they fall outside all the known areas. So let me round this up. Uh, this is a summary diagram and uh, uh, this is the Telstein low stand deposit. Uh, sea levels were high at exactly the level where, where the sea level begins to fall and then it gets shallower and shallower, if, at least that's what I believe. At the same level we shift from rare, very very rare grains but belonging to rare unusual 
types of meteorites, and then there's a fluid of L-chondritic grains um, in here. And uh, of course, you can, this, these are the data, and then you can spend a lot of time with trying to find an interpretation. But uh, to me, it seems logical that the amounts of dust in the solar system must have been enormous, and we have made calculations, and uh, there's no way to get around it. There must have been significant and dramatic cooling by different, and, and there are many different processes that can create cooling, like, um, um, uh, dust shading, of course, sunlight is dust shaded in the atmosphere. And then another process that can be proposed is that um, this, uh, this extraterrestrial material is very rich in iron. So the oceans would get fertilized uh, by iron and leading to carbon dioxide drawdown. It doesn't matter which of these scenarios one believes in, uh, the, re the result will be the same. It will be a sea level fall. So uh, perhaps ISIS, perhaps the ISIS formed, and this explains why the Telstein low stand, uh, how the Telstein low stand can be related to this event in, in space. Uh, I think one important thing when we later to start to talk about possible effects on the Great Ordovician biodiversity um, expansion is that this high influx of dust. It was not just over a day, over a month. It was over hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. So the amount of dust in Earth's at atmosphere and between Earth and the Sun was dramatically enhanced for many million years, for, for, for at least two million years according to our data. And uh, that, that would probably affect the Earth climate a lot. So here is the question that everyone in the audience is ask, waiting for. Is there any connection to the Gobi? Uh, I must say I'm not a paleontologist and uh, I leave it to you guys. Um, I've, I've discussed, I would want to say thank you to Thomas Servais. And after having listened to him, I think your, your, your thing should be renamed from Great Ordovician Biodiversity Event to the great Ordovician biodiversity expansion, because it, to me it looks uh, looks like a very gradual, like a thing going on for a long time. And this concept event is misleading to us that are not in the field. We, we start immediately to think about the Katie Boundary event or something like that, and start to dream of nature and science papers and things like that. So uh, um, I can say like this that, uh, in the Helishi section and also in China where we have studied this, I can't say that there is any clear evidence that anything dramatic happens at, at, uh, in, 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 uh, with the fossils except um, that you get a, a couple of shallow water elements in. But that is, a, that is for this, that I don't think that has anything to, or necessarily has anything to have to do with the, with the great Ordovician biodiversity expansion. It's an, it's another environment and you get other species. Uh, we have in 2008, I wrote with David Harper a paper. This is the Lina section in, in Russia that uh, Christian has, has studied a lot. And uh, I think it's, you know, Christian has done a great job there because he has inspired us to, to move on with our research, has been really, really inspiring his papers. Um, and uh, in 2008, we proposed a relation between an event, a major event in the Gobe sequence of events and the uh, LCPB uh, breakup. Um, and the Luna section is really the section where you could compare our data with Christian's data. The problem is, um, the problem is that um, we have not managed to, to determine at what the exact level in the Luna section where the chromite grains in uh, or the helium-3 comes in. So there is about a two meter interval of uncertainty there and I think Christian has his uh, a lot of biotic changes in the lower part of this and uh, I hope we will be able to resolve this in the future and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Berger. There was someone listening to me. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, so we're 
slightly behind schedule, but I think we have time for um, one question. If anyone has a question that they would like to pose, we can take one. I, I can ask a question. Go ahead, Christian. So, Birger, that was a great, great, great talk. Um, I just, out of curiosity, uh, you mentioned this uh, Tilstein interval in, uh, in Helikis that the query workers has been querying that particular interval. So it seems to me it's better preserved. Is there any chance that it's a taphonomical question uh, that you find all these mic micro meteorites in this interval? Um, absolutely not, uh, because uh, the, strongest, uh, the strongest evidence is actually, I didn't get into the details, but the strongest evidence it does, is that the ratios between the different types of meteorites that we find it changes from 30, 30% uh, 30 H, 30% 30 L, 30% L to 100% L, and like that. And if you look on my if you look on our diagram in the science advances, I forgot to say that it's from a science advances paper. You see that the helium three goes up in the lower part. There's an enormous increase. There's no other other place in the whole geological record where you have a, a such a big increase in extraterrestrial helium three. It's a like three a factor of two hundred fifty or something like that. It could be even more. But the funny thing is that higher up it goes down. And I think that, that there is a winnowing process going on. That's why we don't have any clay. And the fine, fine grained extraterrestrial helium is, is, um, is winnowed away. So that's why the helium three goes down uh, as, the, as the, it becomes shallower. But I mean, my main argument also, or maybe you can answer this, that, that at Lina, um, we have, we have the highest, uh, we have 10 extraterrestrial grains larger than 63 uh, microns per kilogram. They are more abundant than ilmenite. It's the most common, it's, I mean, imagine you take a kilogram of rock and the most common uh, mineral in the heavy minerals residue is extraterrestrial. So you have up to 10 grains. Of course, there, there could be some winnowing, but it, it, it cannot explain. We also have reproduced this in China. We have reproduced it in, in the Puchi River section in China. No, is my answer to your question. Great, thank you very much for such an interesting uh, discussion, Berger. Really, really, uh, I mean, I would ask if, if do you have, um, any grains from North America? You, you showed quite a series of... Important question. On first day, uh, we're going to show the Astrogeobiology Lab where, where we dissolved, for this study that I showed you now, we dissolved 1,300 kilograms of rock. And of course, what we would like to do is to dissolve a lot of rock from other sections uh, and where the sea level fall is, is, is uh, recorded. I, I think in North America, in, in the United States at least, they are very, all the deposits are, very, are like sandstones, very rapidly deposited, has to be condensed sediment. But anyone who knows a condensed section anywhere with clear signs of sea level fall, send me a ton or a thousand kilogram of rock and uh, we, will, we will try to, to test uh, if this can be, to what extent this can be reproduced. And welcome to our tour to the Astro Biology Lab on, on Thursday. Thank you, Christian, for inviting me to arrange that. And, and um, what we're trying to do is to connect the history of life to the history of space. And it's something new, no one, not many people are working with this, but uh, at least we can show that one can produce data. Great, thank you very much, Berger. Let's move along to our next speaker, um, who is Marcello Carrera uh, with his colleague, Matthias Mato and Galina Nestel, and he will be speaking about early to middle Ordovician Alcyonacean or octocoral sclerites from the Argentine Precordillera. So we've got a video um, pre recorded here that Christian is working on. Thank you. 
No, no sound. And the video is not playing on our side either. Yeah, sorry about that. I was watching the video though with sound. <laughs> um, it was great so far. Okay, so I'll just try again. It's a bit tricky with the running the videos apparently. Um, I have to open it first and then close it. Okay. If it's not working, I try to. No, it's it's just because uh, sometimes I get the option to actually show what I'm sharing, and sometimes I don't. <laughs> so uh, this is why it's a bit tricky. No, I still don't get it. You only see this window, right? Yeah, that's what we're seeing. Um, yeah. I can I'm try to screen share it sure from my end. Why it's not the same every time? It's very strange. This is hard. What? It keeps trying, but it seems maybe it's in the background. Yeah, it's in the background. I think I, I don't know why the other times it, it worked, but this time it doesn't. Do you want me to try to share from my uh, now it's now it's here. Suddenly it works. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, hello okay. everybody. Uh, it's working nice out. to be here in the meeting. Thanks. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for their great job answering all my questions and concerns. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my talk deals with a particular group, the Octocorals, which have a very, very few records, uh, mainly in the Paleozoic, many, very few uh, fossil records in the Paleozoic. Uh, the, um, we are reporting here the finding of lower and middle Ordovician uh, Alcyonasian esclerites, which are tiny silicified uh, elements uh, recorded uh, from acid insoluble residues of common samples in here the Argentine Precordillera in the San Juan limestones uh, of Saint West Western Argentina. These uh, uh, units shows the development of thick Cambro or Lovician carbonate platform succession. Well, here are some photos on the units, the San Juan formation. Uh, some of the elements was recovered on the very top of the formation, and others on the middle part in several localities. Uh, the sample sections range from the lower Floyan to middle uh, the Rewillian or middle or provision. And uh, in one of the sections, the, in the Opicodus EV uh, bios, Conodon biosome, and in several sections in the upper part of the formation, which is the Rewillian's, the, the Rewillian one. Uh, the octocorals esclerites are small skeletal elements uh, found among uh, the Alcyonasian suborders Calcasonia or Laxonia, Sclaxonia, and in the Alcyonasian, uh, Alcyonasian soft corals, the so now so called true soft coral suborder Alcyonina. There are uh, very uh, rare, there are very rare among Penatulasian and Stonoliferates. Well, all these records of octocorals uh, is the Cambrian Pihuacia from Oaxaca, Mexico, first reported as a bryozoan, but later reinterpreted by Paul Taylor and colleagues in 2003 as a small octocoral. Here we have no uh, sclerite elements. It is a complete uh, calcareous form. Uh, considered by Taylor and co-authors as a oc small octocoral in, in Mexico, okay, in the Cambrian. But the, the other truly uh, Gorgonasian suborder or Laxonia reported will come from the Ordovician of Wales, and this is considered a true octocoral from Cope in 2005. These small rods 
uh, preserved uh, in a mold and in some cases as uh, filling with the sediment. Uh, the oldest uh, record of, of true uh, sclerital Escherichia elements in the the Octocorals, the Alcyonina, come from the well in the Silurian, the genus Atractocella, Hinde, from Gotland, described by Bengtsson in the Silurian, England, Scotland, and Germany. Uh, in Atractocella, found by Bengtsson, well there are a kind of uh, association. There are no uh, connected or uh, at least uh, an organic connection is seen in these uh, uh, small elements in the uh, Gotland species. And uh, the iso completely isolated forms are found by Rage in the Tractocella de Silurian from Germany. They are typical forms, elongated form, fussy form, um, with uh, small granules as ornamentation. More recently, uh, Fernandez Martinez and colleagues in 2019 reported the genus Telmilration, which is a uh, uh, well uh, small, represented by small sclerites in some kind of organic connection attached to a big uh, calcareous coral, and uh, they are. Uh, made a com paleozoic compilation of the esclerites, morphologies, and this author established uh, four basic types, the spindle, uh, smooth forms, and the uh, spindle uh, ornamented full with the form with the spines. There are the clap shape forms, very more ornamented, and the uh, spindle, uh, elongated spindle form. Well, our association consists of spindle shaped morphotypes, uh, some more elongated or with more gross morphology here, uh, with ornamented with small granules showing a solid interior, as they are preserved as silica and they are not in filling, they are a continuous texture and a structure inside of the escleroids. Uh, some sclerites, uh, as you know, are uh, occur connected by their tips uh, with a neck type uh, connection, zoom out here, in a linear, linear manner. Well, this uh, can be considered as the oldest Alcyonasian sclerite recorded today. The Arcentinian sclerite, uh, well, resemble the Silurian forms, but also uh, some are comparable with recent forms, such as, for example, the genus Sinularia, an Alcyonina form, uh, recent, with the same kind of esclerites uh, embedded in a soft tissue. This is, this is a true soft coral, isolated in this soft tissue. The octocorals though, are mainly represented by the, as I told before, the, cal the Calcasonia, which are in general uh, made by calcium carbonate concentric lamina. The scleraxonia cal cal characterized by the presence of fused esclerites or, or uh, connected esclerites. The olaxonia, which are composed by horny fibers and rare esclerites. And uh, the, al the alcyonina, with, composed with loose esclerites. From those forms we have the similar to the Argentinian forms are the, the Alcyonina skeleton, soft corals, and also the Scleraxonia horny corals, which are made by esclerites. They are not so similar as our esclerite, but they are connected with fibers or both, which can be separated, linked, or fused together forming an skeletal axis. And in this form, these are the axis forming these Gorgonian type uh, colonies. So the Argentina Association are com uh, comparable with the calcareous esclerites of the suborder Alcyonina. However, as it shows some esclerites connected or fused vertically, 
it could be also belong to be belong to the scleraxonian axial spheroids. So this means mixed characteristics found in the Argentinian association may imply a basal stem group elements of the Alcyonina scleraxonia soft coral horny cords. So the according to the age, lower division, and these the oldest form uh, of these groups, Ilurian, uh, they could be uh, the basal stem group of these two suborders. However, the isolated occurrence, we have to recognize that, uh, that uh, prevents uh, the understanding of their organic connection or whether they constitute an axial structure. So it's a preliminary report and uh, uh, it could be possible that this was at the beginning of the diversification of the two uh, suborders. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcello. Are there questions um, that anyone would like to ask? If not, just a comment. Yeah. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I forgot. I, I forgot to say. I realized that in the, in the talk that similar elements was found previously and, and considered by other authors as foraminifers, uh, which is a probably common mistake. <laughs> but uh, it was, as, as you know, solid and uh, different and uh, typically formed of octocorals. Uh, well, it's a, it's a common mistake. But, uh, well, as you know, the assignment is, is, is complex or, and, and it's still speculative at this point as, as put these uh, elements as the in the, the basal diversification of these two groups. It is still speculative that we need more more samples, of course, and, and, and uh, well, and, and, and to be discovered. For, at least now is an unresolved issue <laughs> to date. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting, and and the potential connection between the two clades is really intriguing. So yeah. thank you very much for sharing with us. I've got one question quickly, if I may. Yeah. Um, great to see someone working on this, Marcel. This has been uh, this has been overlooked for too long. Um, but you, um, oh, sorry, I was just wondering if there are any molecular clock dates for these um, the Scleraxonia and and so on, as to whether this would tie in with where they would be expected to find? Sorry, I, I, I hear you uh, in, in, in not well, uh, your connection. I, I, try again, please. I was just going to ask, are there any molecular clock dates which would suggest whether um, oh. ancestors <laughs> should be at that time? Yeah, I know, I know fine. all oh, the molecular clocks are talking about the well, Ediacaram, possible Ediacaram, uh, but not I, in Nidaria in general, but not octocorals, I think. Uh, in general, Nidarians are they thinking that it would could possible Ediacaram, in, uh, but no, it not, it not certainly, it's not certainly yet. Yeah. And you know, as sponges, you know, <laughs> our main focus. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Let's go ahead um, and move to our next talk. So our next presentation will be by Thais Dahl and with his co-author Suzanne Ahrens. And he'll be speaking about five major ecological stages during early terrestrialization that may distinguish the role of life on Earth's atmospheric composition. So go ahead, Thais. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yeah. You can? Okay. We can good. hear you. That's great. All right. So I'm going to take a completely different tech. First of all, uh, most of you might be interested in uh, diversity and what controls diversity. But here I'm actually going to take you, I hope, to my world, which is sort of the opposite and try to see 
if there's any impact of life on our planet and uh, if we can track that um, in terms of the atmospheric composition. Um, and uh, how is that related to Gobi? I think it might be related, um, but I think it's important. And my main point here is basically that we develop a, sort of a more uh, careful no notion of what we mean by early terrestrialization and the emergence of land plants. So let me just uh, move a little bit ahead. When I um, did my PhD, this was the motivation for me. It was uh, how atmospheric oxygen has accumulated to the modern levels. And there were basically two theories out there. Um, uh, one was uh, developed by Rob Ber Bob Berner and uh, my advisor, Don Canfield, um, that atmospheric oxygen has essentially been constant through time uh, at modern levels throughout the Phanerozoic. And then there was uh, this new idea um, coming up um, here in the past uh, decades by Andrew Watson and Tim Linton, that um, maybe the colonization of land actually uh, led to this massive increase of, of atmospheric oxygen and basically changed, uh, forever changed uh, the earth to, uh, to a habitat for humans because humans need at least 75% of modern day atmospheric oxygen levels. Um, so, that's of course very intriguing. And we tried to test this by developing uh, isotope proxies to, uh, to track atmospheric oxygen or at least oceanic oxygen. Um, and what we found was basically, uh, so I should say that this is very important uh, that these models, these long-term trajectories are basically predicted based on some kind of forcing in, in cups. It's, it's the idea that the invasion of plants uh, can drive oxygenation. And in the geocarb models, it's the um, carbon cycle or the geological cycle that is driving any changes. And, um, but anyways, uh, we set out to test this and uh, you can see here the um, molybdenum isotope data that we compiled and we, um, we basically found that, uh, that there were higher molybdenum isotope values in the oceans um, after the emergence of vascular plants. And um, from that, we concluded that the, that the COPS model was sort of more likely to be the, uh, uh, the, 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 the right answer to how oxygen has uh, accumulated in the atmosphere. And that's simply because uh, the more oxygen you ha have in the atmosphere, the more oxygenated would the oceans be. Uh, and, and, and this measure, molybdenum isotopes, is basically a measure of how much sediment burial you have in oxic settings so globally at a global scale so that's why we argue it that way now this uh, is a problematic view of the world and i'd here I'd like to uh, emphasize that the colonization of land is not just one thing and we should start speaking about uh, all the different uh, steps because uh, the geological record may actually preserve uh, insights to what's driving uh, the conditions on our planet and that has importance uh, uh, for, for finding life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, when we look for life uh, beyond Earth, we're looking for oxygen in the atmosphere of planets and we need to understand how uh, oxygen has accumulated. It's also important for understanding climate change and, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, so Basically, this is my uh, reading up on this and my contribution today is mainly just to to, to elaborate on what I think is the uh, terrestrial flora look like um, at, at different points in time. So um, I will call on these five different stages that there was a stage before land was colonized, then there was a stage here with very shallow um, vegetation, bryophyte like plants and then vascular plants emerged and they were all basically uh, confined to the surface of the, of the and, and very uh, close to, to water. Um, so the transition from the ocean to land is associated with this um, uh, uh, water loss problem that the plants, they need water, uh, but as they uh, go out of the oceans, they are of course evaporating that water and uh, the risk is uh, that they die from water loss. 
So they have to cope with that problem somehow and evolve different ways of doing that. And that occurred even later that they evolved root systems that were suddenly deep enough um, that, the, that the plants could stand up. Uh, and we saw this uh, the stature evolving actually here in the middle to late Devonian. And then first, even later, um, like in the, in the Carboniferous here, uh, we have the evolution of seeds um, and seeds are basically uh, very suitable for, for uh, dispersal in, in drier uplands. So, so maybe the earth has been colonized in several stages and um, I'll come back to the evidence for that in a moment. Okay, so let's uh, just uh, summarize what does plants actually do to, um, to our planet and to the climate and to the oxygenation state. And um, Suzanne and I have summarized what we think um, uh, is, is, um, is important in, in this paper um, that just came out in chemical geology. And um, basically what you, we need to talk about is both how uh, water cycle is changing and how the uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere and oxygen uh, is in, uh, has changed over time. And the geological record provides uh, evidence for transitions in many, many um, different aspects. And, and some of them might actually illuminate when exactly these different parameters have changed the most. Um, sorry. So um, by, by having uh, plants on land, we, um, the plants, of course, they, they photosynthesize. So they take up water and and uh, carbon dioxide, and then they release oxygen. Um, and they build biomass, and some of that biomass, organic matter, is basically uh, um, put into the soils where uh, soil respiration occurs. These are processes that wouldn't have happened uh, billions, of years, billions of years ago, um, not at least to the same extent. So, so clearly the colonization of land has transformed the cycles uh, in one way or another. The two things I want to emphasize today um, is basically um, silicate weathering, which is the main process that removes CO2 over long time scales. Um, so you have to uh, know that photosynthesis is in strict balance with respiration. Um, and that means that every uh, um, oxygen uh, molecule that is produced in plants right now is consumed within thousands of years, maybe 3000 years uh, by um, us or some uh, microbe that, that respires. And that's in a very, very tight balance, but there is on long time scales, there's the geological forces that basically uh, alters and changes the, uh, the, the, the concentrations of CO2 and oxygen. And that's, that's the, um, the question here, what's controlling um, those processes? So first of all, silicate weathering. Um, when did we actually start weather a lot of rocks chemically? And by that, um, uh, basically letting CO2 react with rock, um, did plants enhance that? Or is it all controlled by uh, geological forces? The other thing would be uh, that land plants have basically allowed a lot of organic carbon to be stored both on land um, so during afforestation, for instance, but also uh, during burial in sediments. So the uh, terrestrial biomass is ultimately exported to the marine realm and, and buried in sediments. That could in, in principle also have a, uh, an influence on the CO2 drawdown and cool the planet when that happened. So um, I would argue here that the afforestation and the enhanced weathering uh, occurred at distinct times in geological history. And um, therefore, as a community, we can help understanding what the effect on a global scale would be of these processes, um, which I think is extremely important now uh, because we are facing um, uh, temperature rise to um, anthropogenic CO2 release. And um, you can see here what the effect would be if you planted uh, forests all over the continent today. Um, this is now the background prediction for the rest of the century. You see the temperature here on the vertical scale. And if you grew forest all over the planet, um, you would bend the curve a little bit, but uh, this is the effect of CO2 uptake in forests 
it might cool uh, 0.8 degrees or so. It's not a very efficient way of uh, removing CO2. Um, and I also think we have uh, uh, overestimated uh, the uh, importance of afforestation in the uh, Devonian Carboniferous time uh, um, because we have, we've, we've forced our, our models to basically draw down CO2 um, at that time. Rather, I think we should think about enhanced weathering. So the um, uptake of CO2 through uh, dissolution of silicate rocks. And here's a, another study that shows what would happen if you distributed uh, rock powder, basically crushing uh, minerals. Um, and then you could, you could distribute that over an enormous area of the uh, tropics. This is 20 million uh, square kilometers. So it's a, the majority of the tropical croplands that each year will receive five kilos of um, crushed Hartsbergite, for instance. And if you do that, then you can bend the uh, CO2 concentration, which is on a trajectory um, towards maybe 600 ppm or so, um, or even more today. But th this simulation shows that enhanced weathering can really have an important uh, impact. And, and humans are able, in principle, to do this um, according to, to this study. So therefore, I think we have uh, some relevance here um, um, uh, for also for, for, for geoengineering or for, for, for climate mitigation here in the next coming years. Um, so the five ecological stages that I talked about uh, in, uh, a moment ago um, are depicted here. So basically, uh, what could be closest related to Gobi would be the emergence of land plants over here which I could see some uh, showing some atmospheric oxygen curves that, 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 that are not here, but uh, showing that there might be an enormous rise of oxygen during that phase. Uh, very interesting if that's the case. Um, um, here, I would just uh, uh, remind you that these are uh, sort of model simulations. The first ones here, the geocarb model with a constant oxygen had uh, a CO2 drawdown that started over here very late. Um, and that's basically because they thought the air forestation by, by these root plants um, were very important. Okay, um, so, sorry. Um, so where does that, uh, these five stages come from? Well, they come from uh, the phylogeny of the major uh, plant groups. So we, of course, plants evolved in the oceans a long time ago, more than a billion years. And then we see sort of um, both from molecular clock, you can de determine basically the branch points uh, roughly, and there's large uncertainty on those, but the branch points for the different um, um, families or for the different groups of, of plants here. And uh, I, on top of that, I have marked what I think is the oldest uh, representative fossil uh, for each of these lineages. Um, so they come pretty close. So in that sense, I think we pretty much understand sort of the overall ecosystem evolution on, on land. But uh, I'm sure you are all experts on paleontology. So um, many of you are, so you can, you can correct me on this. Uh, but to me, it looks like we have these five stages and they are very distinct in time. Um, one of the things I want to uh, highlight here is if you see here, these early uh, vascular plants that are around here, um, they are very shallow vegetation and they first evolved uh, tree stature here in the middle Devonian. And actually the first standing trees, uh, they emerged in these three different lineages uh, approximately at the same time. And then this famous Archaeopteris tree that started to dominate came a little later here in the late Devonian. But really uh, tree stature and afforestation is a process that occurred here during stage four. And the earlier stages would not have um, created big forests. They are just uh, enhancing weathering, if anything, and, and probably other processes too, but, but not um, uh, producing a lot of forest. Okay. So um, yeah, this is the carbon isotope record that we have used basically uh, uh, as a geochemist uh, point our attention to certain events and Alvaro Del Rey will talk about uh, um, oxygenation during the M-dives tomorrow. So I recommend that you see that. 
And I know that Wednesday, uh, both uh, Eric Sperling and uh, Stucky will, will talk uh, about oxygenation during the Gobi. So stay tuned for that. Um, all I'm saying here is that um, uh, once plants, uh, these different representative plants appeared in the fossil record, they seem to be everywhere. Um, if we go, sorry, if we go from, from the oldest stage here, the first spores are found, um, cryptos, uh, cryptospores that are found on, on several continents here. Worldwide, there are some trilead spores, very rare, but they are found both on Baltica and in, in, um, in, in Morocco, I believe. And, um, and then once you see the, um, uh, the trilead spores are a characteristic of, of vascular plants today, uh, once you see them, they completely take over the spore assemblages and the cryptospores that we saw before disappear. So it looks like once vascular plants emerge, they really uh, uh, occupied the enormous amount of, of, of uh, land mass. So uh, I see that as distinct uh, and very fast uh, invasions that, 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 um, that occur. And then lastly, I show here uh, stage four with the Archaeopteris uh, distribution. They're also extremely widespread once they, they appear. Um, so I, I have a feeling that these things are, are, are sort of um, abrupt uh, transitions and that the different stages uh, can, be, can be viewed um, uh, and the imprint of that uh, ecosystem can be viewed basically from the geological record. Here's a depiction of how the different species would uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, distributed, uh, how close to the aquifers because they all require different amount or all require water and some actually uh, slightly uh, more than others. And, and, and um, yeah, so, so basically in the beginning, they were all restricted to wet plants and very close to aquifers. But with the emergence of seed, plant, seed plants that I haven't shown here in stage five, they might have, have been in drier upland areas. Okay, um, I have no idea about time here, so I'm just gonna continue. <laughs> All right, just stop me if I if I speak too much. But okay, so so of course biology is not the only driver for environmental change, and geology is another one. And uh, so how did the tectonics change through time? And and tectonics is important because it produces rock powder that can be weathered. And 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 how is that uh, basically changing through time? Here I just show you the um, sediment volume record from North America and compare it to the old uh, database by runoff. And you can see this, I mean, hardly any trend. Um, if any, it might be a little bit a decline, but there are definitely huge differences in, in, in uh, rock volume that oscillated here and they seem to oscillate very closely with these uh, orogenic events. Um, so this is super exciting because that may allow us to distinguish what the geological processes do um, uh, and what the biological processes do to, uh, to, to the environmental conditions, if we can track that. Okay, so here is just a, a little uh, movie that I uh, made. I thought a movie, a little show to show you that like we, we see this um, orogenic event um, the, in the late Ordovician collision of Laurentia and Baltica, the uh, sediment volume increases in North America at that time. Um, it makes a lot of sense because uh, as continents collide, there's a lot of uh, uh, rock powder produced. Um, and then you see again a little later uh, here in the end, Devonian, you have a Cadian orogeny, and again. Um, there's an a increase in, in, in sediment yield on, on the North American craton. And when finally, when the um, Pangaea forms uh, by collision of um, Gondwana and um, the Euro-American um, uh, plate here, there's also a, a rise in sediment volume. So, so these things are recorded um, in the geological record and we can track basically um, whether uh, changes are associated with this uh, oscillation or not. Now, I think it is very important to note that that erosion doesn't mean, like more erosion doesn't mean less CO2 necessarily. Um, 
There's been uh, enormous changes in erosion over the Cenozoic, um, and yet the CO2 level has been uh, relatively uh, I mean, modest. There has been a, a decline, but not uh, as much as the erosion has, has, uh, has increased. Um, so there's a feedback between CO2 and the removal of CO2, which we um, need to understand, where plants play an important role. Um, one of the things I want to say is that CO2 fluxes in the volcanic outgassing um, is set by geological uh, uh, processes. And in order to uh, keep CO2 and climate relatively constant, uh, we must have the removal of CO2 through silicate weathering be in very, very tight balance with the uh, outgassing flux. And here's a, a, a model showing what would happen if, if you just for a million year um, have an imbalance of these fluxes by um, one to 25%. And of course, um, uh, it, will, it will basically mean that the CO2 concentration that you have in the atmosphere will, will change dramatically. And therefore there needs to be a, some kind of feedback that prevents this from happen, happening. Otherwise, the climate would have been uh, much more unstable than we have seen. Um, so, so how is that? Okay, here's a, a next little uh, uh, link. And that is, there has been an enormous change in the mud retention on land through uh, with the emergence of land plants. And you see that here, the mud percentage in alluvial uh, deposits have dramatically increased here uh, in the Silurian Devonian. And this is, I mean, if you look at the, it's the same time here at all times, it's just the same plot, uh, plotted in different ways, pretty much. Uh, but you see that the, over the past four and a half billion years, there hasn't been as much mud as we've seen in the past 400 million years. Um, and that has to do with plants. This is clearly a biological, sorry, a biological um, effect. Uh, whether it's the production of mud or it's the retention of mud uh, can be debated, but it has to do with uh, the emergence of, of land plants. Um, so what's exciting about that is that there's an, a sort of a, a state change or a, um, irreversible shift that occurred right here in the Silurian Devonian, um, which, which we should look after. If we look at the uh, atmospheric oxygen and CO2 curves, there's like, as a, like in terms of constraints, uh, anything almost is possible in terms of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, if we go back uh, in the Paleozoic, um, it was probably higher than today, but it may not have been very much higher than, than modern day levels. Um, or it could have been tens of or hundred times higher than, than today. And for oxygen, we know that there's been fossil charcoal. So that means that there's been fire. Um, over the past 420 million years. Might have been a little gap here, but in any case, it shows that the, the oxygen uh, content in the atmosphere is probably really high early on. Uh, actually consistent with the Edwards curve we saw earlier here. Okay. But um, yeah, what I want to say is that the emergence of these vascular plants occurred over here and the um, and, and this is also a time when you have mud retention on land. Um, so now I want to back away, or step away from the oxygenation and the CO2 records, which I think are extremely re, um, uncertain, and then point our attention to something completely different, which is still giving us some insights. And that's the temperature curve uh, that is obtained from conodont apatite and from brachiopod calcite. They pretty much follow each other and there's actually a decline in temperature here during Gobi and also a decline here in the early Devonian, um, uh, late Silurian, and then a further decline over here in the early Carboniferous. Um, and these uh, temperature declines that you see here could or is almost certainly uh, linked to changes in CO2. Um, it's hard to explain such enormous changes in temperature uh, without changing the atmospheric CO2, which is the prime uh, greenhouse gas. There's also uh, a trend here in sea levels su suggesting 
um, more and more ice found on land. You see glaciations and the deposition of glaciations here. Um, and it's debated whether these are perfectly linked or not. Um, here's my point and my take home message. Is that, and that is afforestation, the emergence of these big trees that we have seen occurred during temperature rise and enhanced weathering um, or the emergence of vascular plants occurred during this um, temperature decline. So I think we have uh, basically overinterpreted the emergence of forests um, in terms of its impact on CO2 and we should start looking more at the enhanced weathering um, at this time. So with that, I think the five uh, ecological stages can, can help us uh, uh, distinguish what are the processes that govern an uh, atmospheric composition through time. Sorry. Um, so with that, I'll just um, put the conclusions out here that uh, it, it might be possible to distinguish uh, the effect of afforestation and enhanced weathering by land plants from the geological record and also distinguish the biology uh, and the geological uh, forcing on this. And I think the CO2 and the oxygen records are still very, very uncertain. Um, and the, but the temperature records, as far as I can see, uh, suggest that there's a CO2 decline in several steps associated with enhanced weathering, but not during afforestation. Um, Ultimately, what's driving atmospheric CO2 drawdown has to do with how continental weathering is sensitive to CO2 and not the absolute fluxes. Um, we have put a lot of uh, focus on Gobi, which I think is, it deserves for other reasons. Um, and there's also been models that basically look very much on the uh, ice age that uh, uh, occurred in the Carboniferous or late Devonian uh, Carboniferous time. Um, but maybe we should also think uh, harder about what the effect would be in the late Silurian and early Devonian when we see this mud retention on land and when we see the vascular uh, plants start to dominate on, on land. So um, with that, I'll just thank all of you and recommend that you read this paper. Thank you very much, Taze. It looks like a fantastic paper and I definitely look forward to reading, reading it and digging in. Definitely a very interesting um, and important perspective thinking about weathering and separating that from afforestation. So thank you very much. I think um, we're going to, for the interest of time, um, move along to the next talk. But of course, after the next talk, we're going to have um, icebreakers. So it's a great time to um, continue talking with Taze about any questions and, and comments you might have um, as we move forward. So to close today's session, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce um, my co-conspirator in lots of ways um, and the lead organizer for this conference. And so, um, so our final speaker for today's session is Christian Rasmussen with um, lots of different co-authors involved with um, his presentation about an astrochronological time scale through the Gobi, um, which provides a Baltic intra-basinal insights onto climate and richness. So go ahead, Christian. Thank you, Alicia. Um, firstly, Thais, you should just have said it. You wanted to keep a keynote instead. <laughs> that was a nice talk, but uh, more than 20 minutes, I think. Yeah, that's fine. Anyway, I'll probably keep it a bit shorter. Uh, so, um, we have this discussion, of course, when did the Gobi take place? And it basically boils down to uh, the resolution of the data. Um, and we have, of course, here's the classic Elroy view and the Sikorsky view. And we can see there is a difference uh, in timing. And uh, following Sikorsky, we have this traditional middle Ordovician rise in diversity. Uh, last year, if I can figure out how to move the slides here. Last year we came out with, with this study that really showed that the Gobi event is really a mid Ordovician uh, event. We basically think that we go from a sort of a, a state change in the middle Ordovician where we increase uh, the carrying capacity of the ecosystems 
uh, within the middle and the later Ordovician uh, compared to the earlier part of the Ordovician and, and the Cambrian. Um, I'm just see here if I can move this bar account. Okay. So there has been many people who have speculated on why we have this Gobi event. Uh, also myself and others. Uh, but really, uh, I think one of the main things that it always boils down to is climate. And here we have uh, Julie Trotter, Trotter's uh, very famous uh, diagram showing how uh, the clumped isotopes on, on comedons show a gradual temperature decrease uh, up through the Ordovician. And once we get into uh, the middle part of the Ordovician, uh, we get within the modern day uh, sea surface temperatures uh, in the tropics. So if we plot uh, Julie Trotter's data set on top of our uh, richness curve uh, from last year, we really see that there is uh, somewhat of a um, coincidence here. Uh, it really seems that uh, climate is important when it comes to uh, raising biodiversity levels. And also what is important is that it seems to be of particular importance that we need to get within this uh, present day um, window of uh, temperatures. So really um, from, uh, from my perspective, uh, it has been now for, for many years, I, I, I have thought of what really instigated this ice house. Um, there are, of course, many things that can uh, be uh, the drivers behind it. But, but really, uh, if we think of, of uh, what uh, Alicia said this morning or afternoon or evening, uh, depending on where you're sitting, but in the former session, it's really that uh, in order to get a new species, you need to get them separated. And, and one efficient way of doing that is by having uh, oscillating sea level that uh, keeps going up and down and thus isolating organisms. Uh, and so, of course, if you have an ice age, then you get a lot of uh, water um, stored in the, in the southern hemisphere, in the in glaciers, and then when they melt, you get transgressions and so on. And this is really a, a nice uh, pump for, um, for increasing diversity. So, many years ago, now, I have to say, unfortunately, we initiated a project where we sort of wanted to look whether there was a um, psychostratigraphical component to uh, this onset of ice age conditions. Uh, and so we basically set out to uh, create a new uh, astro um, calibrated timescale through the Ordovician and particularly through the Gobi event. And we are many people uh, in this project, as you see, and um, I just listed uh, most of them here. And we have different disciplines that we work on. But what the main objectives have been is to uh, scan, uh, XRF scan uh, cores through both shale phases and carbonate phases. Uh, you saw uh, Asket talk earlier on the results that you can, uh, uh, you can get from using this uh, fantastic tool. Um, and this is something that we have been working on for years now. And, and now we finally do have some uh, results uh, which is nice, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. This is just basically to show that, of course, uh, when we talk about Milankovitch uh, cycles, we have these uh, different uh, modes of uh, orbital configuration, which is the eccentricity, the obliquity, and the precision cycles. Uh, and this has uh, Aske has already uh, mentioned this uh, quite uh, thoroughly. So I will not go further into this. Now, this thing with uh, what triggered this ice house uh, has also been addressed by uh, Birger uh, last year in a paper where he uh, speculated that uh, this asteroid breakup might, in fact, be the, the cause behind this uh, climatic cooling, which is certainly an interesting theory. Uh, but from our perspective, we are looking at, the, at this onset of ice ice conditions. Uh, more from a uh, psychostratigraphical or orbital forcing angle. So we have looked at the different uh, sections. Of course, we have uh, our uh, data set from, from the East Baltic and from Russia. 
Uh, and now we also have some data from Zuland, which is uh, collected at uh, several uh, localities, but also we have some uh, cores that has been scanned uh, by use of the XRF scanner. Uh, now, uh, additionally to this uh, GeoCenter project, we also, uh, or I am happy or fortunate enough to be included in, in uh, Jan Aldo Rasmussen's project from uh, Steinson in, in, uh, in Norway, in which he has been looking at a uh, corridor richness uh, through a, a succession which is a temporary coeval with, with our stuff. So really we have a chance of, of looking at how the, the faunal dynamics change uh, across uh, the basin and also at the same time look at uh, how uh, the climatic uh, signal is changing. Uh, and this we uh, aim to set into a context of uh, an astrochronological time scale in order to uh, deduce the onset of, the, of this uh, ice house event precisely. So this is the, the classic uh, uh, brachiopod diversity curve that I did together with uh, Dave and, and Jesper Hansen in basically my first paper, uh, where we had uh, sampled bed by bed um, rocks uh, through uh, some quarries in, in Russia, and this was the resulting curve. Uh, and basically, this shows that, that once we get into the Darwinian, we start to see a rise in brachypod uh, diversity. We took this a bit further and uh, put it into an eco-stratigraphical uh, context where we demonstrate that as uh, sea level uh, lowered, this was basically when we had the highest peak in brachypod richness. So this really linked uh, in a regional uh, setting uh, the the onset of ice house conditions to uh, rise in biodiversity. And then uh, many years later, we did basically the same, but just based on uh, stable isotopes. And we did find that uh, uh, temperatures seemed to drop quite drastically. Uh, and then biodiversity uh, for brachypods started to rise. Um, and this, of course, uh, was. Uh, very much mirroring what uh, Julie Trotter found. Uh, but this was, of course, on uh, this particular study was on a bit by bit scale, so it's really, really high resolution. But what's worth noting here is that the onset of, of Ice House really seems to uh, come before uh, the rise in, in bracket pots. And, and this is uh, somewhat interesting and something that uh, I have started to dig into uh, by uh, looking into some of the, the older literature. Um, and really, here are just one of them. This is uh, Arne Nielsen's uh, blockbuster from uh, 1995. Uh, if we look here, he had, based also on biophases, he conducted a, a sea level curve where you see that there is a sea level lowering, a, a big sea level lowering, I should say, in the top Volko and into the Kundan uh, of the Baltic regional stages. So this is basically uh, the topmost Opinion and into the lowermost uh, Derry William. Here's another page turner from uh, Jan Audun Rasmussen and Sven Stogge, uh, looking at conodons across uh, several sections in, uh, in Norway. And then he also followed up with a, a systematic um, work on that study. And just before the weekend here, Sven came into my office rather surprised as he had realized that he had actually written this paper with Gabriella. Uh, some 24 years ago. Uh, and this is really an interesting paper because it's really showing the same patterns as uh, we see in both the triobite and the conodont data. Uh, and I will show that uh, here. So on the right, we have uh, this paper Sven told me about. And uh, on the left, we have uh, Jens data from uh, Norway. So basically, we are comparing a shelf margin se section in, um, in Norway with uh, a, a shallow carbonate session in uh, in Öland, in, in Sweden. And we see that this main drop in sea level is occurring in the in the Norlanticus and in the so-called anti-variable zones uh, across the basin, basically. Uh, and this is actually below the level that um, I found the ice house together with colleagues, uh, which was uh, up in basically this interval. But basically, our bracket data 
does not go into this level. So, so we hadn't really studied that before, but it seems like the, the ice is actually coming in beforehand, which is interesting. So uh, in order to also get uh, some uh, isotope data on these uh, biophases, uh, or to support these biophases data, we went into the field uh, on Öland uh, to the classic section uh, at the uh, Hornsrud, or this is rather, this is north of uh, Hornsrud. And basically we chose this section because uh, we have detailed chromosome stratigraphy. We also have detailed lipid stratigraphy. And we basically collected uh, all bits from this section uh, to uh, get uh, isotope samples. Um, oh, we did the same for the neighboring section, which penetrates a bit further up uh, in the section. Uh, this is from the cave of Horns Wood itself. And uh, in order to track uh, the development across Öland, uh, we also uh, collected uh, in Degaham Quarry in southern Öland, we collected not at a bit by bit scale, but still in, in quite high resolution. Uh, and we go through this very uh, Sveonides bit or, or testing bit as Birger uh, uh, showed us before. And then on top of this, we also uh, did uh, both uh, carbon-13 and uh, uh, oxygen isotopes on, on brachiopods through the, the core harm core uh, from selected levels as, as you see here. So in all, we actually get quite a good coverage through uh, the early and middle Ordovician, as you see out here. And most importantly of all, we have a very, very detailed uh, conodont uh, biostatography that we can tie this to. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is uh, the results from, uh, from the, the stable isotopes from, from Öland. And, and what is interesting here is that we have uh, four different localities um, and uh, they cover different intervals, but where they all overlap is uh, in, in this uh, interval here. And what we see is really, really fluctuating levels uh, or ratios of, or values of, uh, of oxygen isotopes, which is uh, very consistent with what we see in, uh, in Russia. Uh, we see uh, this could be an indication that we, we start to get uh, an ice age, and this is in exactly the same levels as uh, we see the biophasic data show a, a, a big drop in, in, in sea level. So really, we seem to have a, a, a good indication of, um, of the onset of an ice age, both based on biophasics and on stable isotopes uh, through, through this part of the basin from, from the Eastern Baltic and Russia and into uh, Sweden also. So in order to develop uh, a, a astrochronology, we have also uh, sampled uh, the, the cores. Here we have, I should say that this is data from the Tinks Queen Core, which, which we have data from by uh, collaborating with uh, Mikael Kellner. Uh, and on the right here, we have our own uh, Coham Core, which is uh, collected just offshore in Northern Öland. Uh, and we have a detailed samples of, of carbon-13, as you see, and, and basically this enables um, a very solid uh, correlation, both based on biostratigraphy and chemostratigraphy, uh, which can form the basis for a, a cyclostratigraphical approach. Now, besides these data, we also have uh, this uh, XRF core scanning data from both cores, uh, in which we have scanned in high resolution uh, uh, through, uh, well, the core core has been scanned all through, but the Tink screen core has been scanned in, in, in this interval down here, basically enabling us to have uh, the limestone sequence throughout most of the middle for the mission. Um, and Nicolas Thibault has done uh, some uh, remarkable work on this. And basically, uh, as you can see here, um, he has uh, depicted an, a number of uh, eccentricity cycles uh, through basically all of the middle Ordovician, um, which basically enables us to um, date these rocks very precise, uh, especially with uh, the uh, uranium lead ages that are now uh, available. Um, so basically we have a, a good control on, on the 
on the time issue basically through the, the middle of vision and we have a good control on the uh, onset of uh, the ice house conditions and we can link this to uh, the brachypod uh, richness data which uh, I showed you earlier but uh, actually uh, we can also now link it to uh, the data that I uh, uh, mentioned that we have together with uh, Jan Audun because he has been working in uh, science on uh, which is the shelf margin sequence and what we see apart from this big white box where something happens is that once we go up through the science on section and we get into uh, the uh, Nolanticus uh, zone and in the Darwinian we start to see a burst in, in um, conodont uh, diversity uh, and this is extremely interesting because this basically shows us that we have a, a rise or a sharp rise in diversity in both brachypods and in conodonts. And this is basically across the basin. Uh, the conodonts are from the shelf margin sequence and the brachypods are from the, the shallow water uh, carbonates. Um, so this uh, leads me to my uh, conclusions, which is basically this uh, chronology. Uh, through uh, the, the Gobi interval. And here we have uh, tied uh, the uh, Nicolas Thibault's uh, uh, orbital, uh, um, what do you call it, yeah, his astrochronology to uh, the, the link or the uranium lead age uh, provided by uh, Anna Stinchcock and myself a few years ago. And with this in hand, we can actually start to uh, put absolute ages on uh, the evolution of of these events. So we see, for instance, that uh, we come in, we come from a, a relatively warmer interval into the Pingian and into the lower Darwinian, where we suddenly get this change to cooling. And then slightly after that, basically only something like uh, 200,000 years after, we see a rise in both brachypods and conodonts. Uh, and this is really uh, the onset of uh, the Gobi uh, on Baltica. But this is, as you see with this green curve, also where we see it globally. So this, uh, to me at least, suggests that, that uh, this idea of having an, an, an Earth state change at this point in time uh, seems to be uh, very uh, feasible. Uh, yeah, and with that, I think I will end my talk here. So I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Christian. That's very exciting new data. Um, that you have coming out soon um, and, and, and we're able to share with us. So are there questions for Christian about his talk? And I'm happy to hear that there was sound on also. <laughs> Beer? Yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. even, uh, I wonder how did you get this raised hand because I was looking for it everywhere. It's a little bit strange. It's under participants by some strange Ah, that's why I couldn't reason. find it. Okay, because I wanted to say it under the introduction, but been, I couldn't find it. It should have been under reactions, I think. Yeah, yeah, under reactions, exactly. you can clap your hands. I, I clapped, I forgot to clap my hands. I clapped my hands for you now, so is that fine? <laughs> okay, a quick question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the problem is I, I get very inspired by your work all the time and then you change and then you change I feel sometimes you change your mind that, that don't, don't wouldn't you agree that this Sphaeronitas bed or Telstein bed does represent an, a much stronger signal of sea level fall than many other um, things that you see throughout this section I mean, I talked with Andre Dronov and he said, yeah, this, you've, you've, you can trace this dramatic sea level fall all, all over Russia, all over Baltica. And, and, and uh, so, if, so, so what is your idea about that sea level fall? Why, why, why did that happen, that sea level fall? Uh, yeah, I don't know why it happened, but it's uh, certainly there uh, for sure. Uh, but, but the thing is, I, what, all of the data that I have presented previously has always been from like uh, the base Kundan up because that's basically what I knew from my brachypods. But going into this uh, literature from, from basically what Anna and, and Jan and Sven has been doing, I can see that we have basically a big sea level drop going in. Well, basically the flowing, the Pantheon boundary is a major sea level drop. Right? We have a regional surface, at least on, the, on Baltica, 
Uh, but actually going further up into the Dapingian, it seems like we have uh, larger sea level drops and they continue and they also, and the Tilstein is part of that, sort of a, a prolonged trend of, of lowering sea level. Um, and I think actually, but I'm not an expert on that, but I think actually also in the Tilstein, you have actually the first uh, drowning event, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, but then you get some more uh, oscillations after that. I'm just gonna see if I can see it. Yeah, I think actually the, the, the just before the testing, you get a short drowning, boom, and then you get a, 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 a lowering again. So something is happening in this interval. I completely agree with you on that. Uh, uh, and so the, the question is, of course, when was the ice there? Uh, and that's sort of what I'm uh, trying to look uh, for now. When, when, did, when did it start, so to speak? What I mean is that sea level curves are, that's something difficult to, to, to produce and uh, you can, for the mid order vision, uh, I've seen papers where they compare sea level curves and you get the opposite. <laughs> yeah. And and what I say in the hellish section, I don't see, I mean, even an idiot uh, in sedimentology, they can't miss the, the, the Telstone bed. It's there, it's you know, the Sveronitas. It has for, for 150 years, people have thought about what it is. So, I mean, I don't say that you're wrong, but I, I say that maybe we have to think of, uh, of in orders of magnitude or, or the level of change. I mean, no one, could, you always have a change in climate. For example, if we, uh, we, we, today there is a natural change. We are probably, if it wasn't because of our carbon dioxide, we were today going either into an ice age or into global warming anyway. And, and the, the carbon dioxide will, will um, uh, um, and magnify, or, or um, if we already work towards the warming, the moving towards the natural warming. And I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in what I say or that what you say that rules out that we were, we were into a, a getting into a cooling situation, and then something happened that uh, that. Um, Triggered or that in, that 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 uh, increased uh, the rate of cooling that that uh, added on the negative side. So, so maybe one day, Christian, we we could become friends. <laughs> really, we are friends. I'm joking. So, so. <laughs> what I say is that 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 there are many many ways how this could be. And, and yeah, please, I, and I, I think I, what I think what we have is very concrete evidence, very empirical, very. Uh, we, we, we look on section by section. I think it would be interesting to have more of that data where you can relate the biodiversity changes bed by bed to oxygen isotope changes and things like that. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was more of a comment than a question. Yeah, so I was thinking what the question was, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but the, question, the, que the question was, don't you agree that the tail stand, the spheronitis bed, is a dramatic uh, signal of, of sea level fall. It's 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 much um, more obvious. It's much yeah, more clear. It's it's, uh, it's certainly from from if you look only at the Kundan, it's certainly probably the the second or, or, or third largest drop I would say, and there's an even bigger one when you get just uh, yeah in Russia it's just a few meters above. Then you get an even bigger one, right? But if you compare it to what it came from, I mean, if you go down from the from the uh, early, what do you call it, eBay zone, you have basically a drop of something maybe like uh, in the order of 100 meters or something. So it's it's much more below the the, the volcanic content boundary. Um, and so that's why it's just interesting to see when did the ice actually start? I mean, is it is it is it a sharp transition into an ice house world or is it a gradual one? And when did the, the faunal response come in relation to that? That's pretty interesting, I think. Uh, and one thing, one way of doing it is, is certainly to 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 get a, a good hand on, on on absolute time, and that's uh, what's been missing for uh, yeah, for every uh, always basically, right? So yeah, I I could say like like last comment that let's look on the ice age that we are in now. I mean, there was something we don't even know if it was mid Eocene or late Eocene when it started. Then there was one big jump in the early at the onset of the Oligocene, and there was another jump, another jump, and and uh, 
I, I, I think the, uh, there will be so there would have been something similar, and um, that could could be po positive and negative uh, feedback mechanisms that. Uh, that uh, I, I could I could ask you a last question. Why would these enormous uh, Why would these enormous amounts of dust that we have evidence for that they were spread throughout the solar system? Why would they not cool the Earth? Uh, that that would be another way of stating it. Why I'm, I'm not we saying have that the data. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that they didn't cool the Earth at all. I'm just saying that they, it was probably cooled before. So that, uh, that, 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 so, um, that, that, that I can, that is, it could have been like that. Yeah. So, so, yeah. okay. It's a pity I can't join you for a beer now. <laughs> I would have liked to do that. Okay. Well, I'm here all by myself actually. So <laughs> <laughs> I go and take a whiskey on my own. <laughs> well, yes. Well, and with that, um, that seems like a great place to end the session for today. So I want to thank all of our speakers in the second session um, and this morning's as well. And I would like to remind everyone that our session times do shift every day as we move through the four days of this conference. The reason for that is so that we're not continuously disadvantaging any particular group of people in any particular time zone. Um, but that does mean that tomorrow's session will start six hours before this one did. So if you were happy with today, um, you might be asleep like me um, tomorrow when it's 2 a.m. Um, in the US when the session kicks off. But um, we are archiving um, all of the talks are being recorded and Christian is going to be posting these to um, the IGCP 653 YouTube channel. So if you have missed talks or will miss talks as we move through the week, um, please do take the opportunity to um, investigate things of interest to you um, or things that you didn't know were of interest to you. Because one of the beautiful things about the IGCP projects is that you do get to listen to talks that you might not otherwise listen to at a large meeting like uh, EGU or GSA. Um, and having this cross-pollination of disciplines is really just such a core strength of the IGCP project program. So check out the talks. Um, and now we're going to, um, you know, get a beverage, a water, a beer, a whiskey, um, whatever makes you happy. Um, hang out and keep talking or move on with your day or night. And we will um, reconvene tomorrow uh, or keep talking now. Your choice. But thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh,